Mark is putting up the front page. You know, I, I met our special guest in December, and after I heard his talk, I knew I had to invite him to our spiritual dialogues because the because the purest form of spirituality was to me exhibited in the talk at my university where I heard him. Of the 40 some years that I have been in higher education, I have not heard another professor actually who gave a talk about why education desperately need to add and weave empathy and imagination to our structural curricular and cultural uh, ways of being systemically. I honestly have not heard a talk like Professor Isaac Bari has done. So Saborno Isaac Bari is one of those spiritually based and love anchor professors I have wanted to have in my own educational journey. And so I just thought that I have to share professor with all of you because I was truly inspired um, by him. He has been interviewed, uh, tested, certified by renowned university scientists and presidents. And he has been recognized by University of Harvard when he lectured there and the president of the United States, President Barack you know, Obama. So his intelligence is of no question solving PhD level math, chemistry, physics problems. And I know that he has been interviewed since he was two years old and he has spoken in front of thousands of people. And he also and led social justice movement in his short nine years of life so far. So I can't imagine that for this professor adding a century onto that, what the world might be like when Professor Bari is 109 years old, adding another century to his life. It blows my mind when I think about it uh, in terms of what he has to share. So our dialogue is and isn't really about his special talents, like speaking at six months old or solving math and chemistry problems at you know age two. I just wanted to have a dialogue with the professor, Professor Saborno Isaac Barry, about his mind, about his heart, and about his own spirituality, because that's the way how he inspired me. So, Professor Bono, Professor Isaac. <laughs> it's so nice to be know. here. So nice to have you. And I think that you know now that you're gonna be my favorite professor from this point forward, ever since I heard you talk. And your talk was about um, empathy and imagination in the education system. So that was wonderful. Now, we're going to start talking about yourself first, and then we're going to evolve into different areas. So do you mind we take a journey with you? Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me here to this great spiritual dialogue where people of all ages, all races, all ethnicities, all religions can come together and watch how great people and great inspirational figures talk about themselves and their spirituality with you. Okay. And no doubt that, you know, we're all curious souls. So it's not every day that we meet someone like you. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you very average, you know, curiosity questions by taking that journey uh, with you about your life. Is that, do you have any uh, first memory of yourself? You know, what's the earliest and what, what do you remember? Well, I don't really remember the early, early parts of my life when I was three months old or six months old. Well, I would say that um, my earliest memory would be when I was one. And that's probably because it was a very profound memory. If it was something normal, I probably would have even forgotten that. But 
when I was one, one day, I decided to take to stealing uh, one of my father's pieces of chalk. Now, um, he was uh, in 2013 when I was a two-year-old, uh, my f- or a one-year-old. My father was a security guard who was also studying mathematics, and so he would always be uh, doing these strange calculations and these strange re- uh, and weird problems that kept burning in my brain every time I looked at them. But I just couldn't, what wasn't able to figure out what these challenges, what these problems even met. I mean, I could see repetition. I could see um, that one thing, two things make another thing. I could see the mathematical operations, but I cu- just couldn't visualize what they did. And so one day I decided to try it. I started thinking, maybe this chalk is just the way you are able to write mathematics. And so I decided to pick up a chalk thinking that I could do the same thing as my father. And instead, I was able to draw a big circle with a smiley face on it, which isn't as impressive as the mathematics that my father was doing. But I cut myself some slack because I was one year old at the time. So that was, was yes, you cut yourself some slack, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's my earliest memory, and it's what got me in love with mathematics. And my father found out that mathematics was my passion when he came into the room and his jaw dropped when he saw me trying to write on the chalkboard. Mm. And you wrote and you drew a smiling face. I wonder, was that a symmetrical smiling face since you were in math? <laughs> no. No. Not at all. <laughs> Okay, so if in in the short life that you have, and you have evolved since you're one year old, now is most of the things you know pretty much self-taught. Well, um, since I was one year, year old, I think I've evolved just a little bit, and most of the things I do are sometimes self-taught, sometimes I do the research myself, sometimes I help myself, and sometimes it comes by the virtue of somebody who wants to help me, like uh, very often my brother or my father, who can solve, uh, who combined together can solve almost any problem that I have. Usually, it's either them who help me with problems that I can't think to solve myself, or it's me um, trying to do my own work, trying to do my own research. Okay, so most of the time you're doing all self-study, doing your own research. All right, what would you say um, is the biggest part your parent played in your becoming who you are today? Well, parents played in becoming who I are today. Parents can shape anybody. It can shape you, uh, they can shape you, and they give you not only all of your development and teach you in your early life, but later on in your life, they shape your ideologies, they shape your life. And if you have bad parenting, then don't go crazy when your child becomes a criminal or something else. So, I think that parenting is extremely important when it comes to a child's life. It shapes their ideology, it shapes what they will become when they get older, it shapes them. And so, my parents have played a big role in my life just as well. And so, my parents are the ones who have been nurturing me, my parents are the ones who got me into mathematics and science, my parents are the ones who have given me such a beautiful environment, who have encouraged me so much over and over again, and who have taught me and helped me, even in my times of stress. Hmm. Well, what would you say that, uh, you have you done things that's mischievous, like an average child? Uh, sometimes. You've got to do mischievous things sometimes. And when I do mischievous pranks, it's usually against my brother. I <laughs> <laughs> see. Okay. Well, at age nine, you know, nine is a magical number for me. And I wonder, at age nine, uh, do you feel inside a congruency between your age 
Not that you know what a 20 year old will feel like. So I'm thinking about myself. I think I, even asking this question is unfair of you that you must know that you, you're not an average nine year old. So how do you find your age, the number congruent with who you are? Well, my age, I just see it as just a number. I mean, it's just the amount of uh, um, just the amount of years since you were born. Uh, uh, but I don't really see people say nine point five six years old or anything like that. But it's the, simply the amount of years since you were born. It's nothing more than that. It doesn't it does dictate or define your limit? And I've seen some people joke: if age is just a number, why is it also a word? Hmm. So what you're saying is. Age is just a number. It should not limit what you think about your potential, regardless of what that number is. Yes, we should encourage both the、uh, people, young and old. It's never too late to step、uh, step into math and science. It's never too late to encourage your too late to encourage yourself to start learning, to start learning about the world around you and what you can become just with mathematics and science. It's、uh, truly amazing what you can do with just math and physics. Well, I shouldn't be saying just math and physics. Because math and physics, literally, the things that dictate our entire world. Hmm. We're going to talk about that. Not that I can ask you in-depth questions or anything like that. But if you were to introduce yourself, how would you introduce yourself? Well, how would you describe yourself? How would I describe myself? Well,、mm-hmm. a lot of people would describe themselves by their ethnicity or their race. Or、um, their religion, or the the occupation that they take up sometimes rarely. But I see myself as not a global professor, as not a Jew, as not a Muslim, as not a Hindu. Well, we should be taking pride in our. We should be taking pride in what we are. But we shouldn't be pushing others down, kicking others. We shouldn't be putting others down and well, killing others, enslaving others, torturing others because of they're of a different race or because they're a different ethnicity. Expr- I think that we should all acknowledge each other as humans and express pride without putting others who don't share that pride with you down. So this pride of who you are to you is very important. Well, yeah, kind of. But we should all identify ourselves as humans for the most part. We should think of ourselves not as white, black, Asian, Hispanic,、uh, Muslim, Islam,、um, Jew.、Um, I mean, you get the point. I mean, if I said that I was a Muslim, I would. If I We pushed others down because I was a Muslim. Then I would be excluding others who aren't in the Islamic faith. I are you Muslim? Well, I mean, I was born into a Muslim family, and I'm.、Uh, but I frankly believe in all religions, and so I mean. It, are you not Muslim? Well, I am Muslim, but however, I think that, that we should be able to respect other religions like Hinduism. You believe、Buddhism. in God. What? Do you believe in God? Well, can we can we can we、uh, pause your question? I'll have I have time for your、is. questions if you can, so we don't interrupt our professor. I、um, think in your book,、uh, the love, your first author book, professor, you have said that I'm not only a Muslim, but a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Jew, and a Christian. Uh, I read your book, *The Love*, and that's what you said. That's actually a very important、uh, part of your book. That is really expounding to the culmination of you coming with that statement about your own identity. That you're not only a Muslim, but you're also a list of other things. And、uh, because the question is asked, I thought that I'll bring this up to you that.、Um, You are a you are a fan of the poet laureate of Bangladesh. You know who I'm talking about. Um, either Tagore or Nazir. Kazi. Kazi. Nazir Islam. Yes, and、uh, that this is actually in your book, and I thought it was I did not know that、uh, 
He has said this in 1920. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote that down, actually. Where did I put that? Um, um come, uh, uh, come, what are Hindu? Come, uh, Muslim, come, Jew, uh, come, Christian. Uh, together we shall stand. We shall quarrel no more. Just a reminder of that statement. Thank you very much. Okay. You've got it memorized. So thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to continue my journey and, and talking with you a little bit more about your own self-identity, first of all. And so I am in leadership development. I do a lot of leadership development programs. So of course, I have to ask you this question. Is that, do you see yourself as a leader? Why or why not? I see myself as a leader because I have, well, I have leadership. Uh, I am the leadership of multiple organizations, one of which I set up myself, the love. I am also the mayor of Little Bangladesh, and I have motivated the people of Little Bangladesh. And as you said yourself, you, you were so impressed by my speeches at California State University. And I'm sure that... Um, and I'm sure that a lot of people were impressed by that too. I see myself as a leader because I have already been the leader of multiple organizations, of multiple communities, and I was also, um, I guess, a leader of Harmony Bites, which is a charity organization in Los Angeles as well. And so, it's, I mean, I see myself as a leader because I have already been a leader of multiple institutions and multiple organizations who has captivated and motivated others. That would be my short one sentence answer. Mm, they'll captivate and motivate others. Uh, I give this test to my students. So what are some of the characteristics of good leadership? In your mind, since you're already practicing leader, <laughs> what are some of the good strength that you have as a leader? Would you describe that, that you possess as a leader? I would say you, to be a leader, you must be brave. You must be courageous. You must be willing to take on challenges that you never have before. And even if you fail at those challenges, you have to learn and try again. Trial and error is one of the most important things. And Einstein himself said, if, you don't if you've never made a mistake once in your life, you've never tried anything new. Coming from Einstein himself. Is it not smarter than you, Einstein? Well, so... I mean, we to be a good leader, you have to take on challenges that you've never faced before. You have to take mm. on, you have to think of new ways around things. You have to be creative and you have to be imaginative. In fact, that was one of the things I've encouraged, not only in my niece, but also my California to state university speech. And so... Mm. I think it is very important not only to take on new challenges, to think outside of the box, but also to be a motivator, to be great at public speaking, and to motivate others. And it is also not just a good idea to speak to others, but it is also a good idea to be friendly to others and be kind. So being a leader means uh, doesn't mean that you're going to oh, sit on a cop. Uh, being a leader doesn't mean you're going to sit on a golden throne um, above all else. Being a leader simply means that you are the top of an institution, and that you will lead every single person that is behind you and do as just as much work as every single person who is behind you. If you heard that, of course. That's great. Well, you're saying that do just as much as someone that you're leading as well. So <clears throat> that's a great principle. It sounds like servant leadership to me. So we're going to leave that alone. Uh, you are going to be, you already are a wonderful leader from the, what you had just described. And uh, I know that you are also a very humble person on the side as well. So let's talk about your uh, favorite topics, Ria. Not that I'm anywhere close to an expert at all. And so I want to talk to you about this physics, right? Since your physics is your specialty, 
Um, do, how do you perceive the relationship between physics? What you said earlier that everything in the world is connected and is related, has something to do with physics and math. So what is the, you perceive the relationship between physics and our physical world? Let's, let's go there first. I mean, it's described as our physical world for a reason. Physics gives us a way to uh, describe and dictate the motion of every single thing using mathematics. And so, um, the, there's gravity, there is special relativity, general relativity, electromagnetism, nuclear forces, quantum mechanics, and all of this allows us to dictate every single reaction in the universe just using mathematics. As, um, as I've said a lot of times before, mathematics is kind of like the language of physics. And so physics gives us a way to express the physical world mathematically. Mm. So in your mind, do you have clarity of using uh, physics and math that you can understand this, uh, the mysteries of the world that we cannot uh, comprehend as someone like me who is an average person just don't comprehend the reality of our mysteries in the world. Do you understand it from using the physics and math? Well, the mysteries of the world today, kind of like um, quantum mechanics or dark energy or, well, string theory or the theory of everything. There were a lot of mysteries in the world. And I've seen Stephen Hawking talk about this himself, but he uh, um, but a lot of people in 1980, especially physicists, were like, oh my goodness, we've almost finished everything. We already did quantum mechanics. That means we're already at the theory of everything. But now we've realized that we're not even close to finishing physics. Although there's one final thing left, that's like a final boss. It's kind of like the you know, final big hurdle in the way of understanding every single thing in the universe mathematically. This theory of everything. Kind of because some things are incompatible with one another. We still don't understand stuff that we should be understanding. There are still matter that we're theorizing about that could be influencing our universe that we can't even interact with, like dark matter or dark energy, which is said to make up combined, um, well, more than the baryonic amount of matter. Baryonic amount of matter is like all of the light waves, all of the, phys all of the physical things we have, like this sheet of paper, or my hands and my dress and my shirt, or this computer that you're interviewing me on. Or could I say interviewing? I'm not sure. No, we're not interviewing. We're just having a wonderful dialogue. How's that? <laughs> I guess. I am. I'm enjoying it. So... Do you feel that you have the confidence that in your lifetime you'll be able to come up more theorems that could uh, enlighten us about the mystery of the world? Hopefully, because I mean there are so many uh, missing puzzle pieces in um, physics and we've only just begun to get closer to the theory of everything. I hope that I can get to the theory of everything within my lifetime. If, and if not, then I'm sure that I will at least take a step forward in the right direction. And so, okay. I think that, I mean, even representing every single thing in the world mathematically may not seem like um, something you we should be wasting time on, to, um, according to the average Joe. But, I mean, it allows us to get so much more of an understanding of the world around us. And that's what we've been seeking since the beginning of humankind. We've been seeking answers. We've been seeking curiosity. And, I mean, um, this kind of intertwines with religion a little. Because, I mean, a theory of everything would mean that maybe we could finally get some answers to why we are here or what th there is going on the past the boundaries of the observable yeah. universe. Mm. Yes, I understand that. And I think that uh, since you know a lot about physical laws, do you see a linkage between the physical law and the spiritual law? And I ask you spiritual law because I know you are a person with spirituality. So do you see the linkage between spiritual laws and physical laws? Well, I'm not very 
very sure about spiritual laws. I mean, as you said, not everybody here believes in spirit, and I'm not so sure about spiritual laws. I haven't really uh, seen anything about them, but I would like to respect all faiths and all religions, and especially every single person who believes in faith. And so, that is why I think that, I mean, even though I don't really see any kind of thing about, well, spirituality, or I don't really see any spiritual laws, as far as I know, um, there could be something, because, I mean, we never know. We haven't found out anything about the spirit yet. We haven't found out anything about the soul, other than failed experiments, which haven't uh, um, fished up any evidence. So, right. I mean, f the relationship between physics and spirit, well, spirit, I mm -hmm. see, is kind of just like, um, spirit, we see, I see, is just kind of consciousness, and we're still not so sure about consciousness, because psychology, just like physics, is kind of like an unfinished puzzle. We don't know what consciousness is, and what um, differs me from, say, this calculator. I mean, you could say that I'm conscious that this calculator isn't. I mean, who knows? Maybe this calculator is conscious. But, um, I mean, um, we can't really um, talk about the spirit right now because we don't know much about consciousness or too much about psychology yet. Okay, I understand that. Um, do you believe in the spirit? Do you believe in God? I think uh, earlier there was a question that jumped out at you. Do you believe in God, the creator? Well, I mean, first of all, I would kind of like to bring up a quote from Einstein himself as well. Um, science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. So, I mean, science and religion um, have not had a good history of coexisting together. And I mean, if I'm one in science, I would say, um, don't go too far into religion without scientific justification. I mean, there have already been things like flat earth, Scientology, anti-vax, but uh, second, I think second, Einstein as well, even though he was an agnostic, he at least sort of believed in a God that had created the universe, created the laws, and set everything in motion. Because if not, how did the Big Bang happen? How did the universe get created? So, mm, that's why I think that, I mean, there may be a God, there may uh, be, uh, and there probably is a God that's created the universe, but I'm not so sure about interference with the universe Rocky after it's creation. What? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is the ground. Um, okay. We, we, we're going to leave some time at the end for you to ask you understand questions. Rock, the crown? That is what made it. You understand? Okay. If you can leave your questions until the end, I'll, I'll promise I'll give you some time to ask in the dialogue. Yeah, with the yeah, the scientific question, Liz. Yeah, so the science, uh, I'm asking the professor about your own spirituality that you do believe in the spirit, as you said, as uh, Einstein did. And I want to know that, do you have any explanation about how you are created, how you have become to be uh, with such special talent? Do you have any explanation of that, Professor? I would say it all comes down to a lottery with parenting. I mean, parents are the one who give you a good environment to be nurtured. There are probably millions around the world with the same skill as me, but they probably have parents. And I think I've seen a person in South Africa say to me this to me before during a business breakfast conversation. But there's probably some child doing uh, advanced mathematics in a demented village, uh, in a very small village, uh, probably in the middle of the desert, and being called demented and crazy because nobody ever saw th that mathematics before and being bullied because he was doing something so special. I mean, you have to stand up and you have to do something unique. I mean, I think that was even mentioned in the song that you played earlier. Um, you have to do something that nobody's ever done before. 
Yes. So, I yes. mean, it's uh-huh. very... Mm, sorry? Ron, what? You have an issue. You have an issue with God now. The Brachista Crone has made everything, essentially. Brachista Crone, you know mathematics, essentially. Um, we can leave those questions for the end. You know what a Brachista Crone is? Yes. All right. So, mm, sorry. Oh, God issue then. Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking, but we can have some time at the end for you to dialogue with the professor. I promise that I will give you some time. If if you let me go through my questions and I wanted to dialogue with the professor. Okay. You continue, if you continue, sir, I will remove you from the, I will will remove you from the the spiritual dialogue. Because I I promise I will give you time to have this exchange with the professor. But let me go through some questions. I want to have the professor to express himself without some interruptions. And then, so we can understand him uh, a lot more. I certainly want to to hear his thoughts and feelings. So let's let's continue, uh, Professor. So what is what do you think that has been so far most misunderstood about you as a person or as a child, as a scientist, or as a genius, as people have uh, coined you as a genius of you know today? Is there anything that you want to clarify? that you have been misunderstood as a person or as whatever the blank may be? Well, I guess a lot of people, um, a lot of people, um, I'm not very sure about saying uh, misunderstandings about me or misconceptions about me. Um, hmm. Can't really point to anything. Um, so, um, I'm not very sure about any misconceptions that I have, but, um, thank you for that question. Hey, now I want to give you some platform to talk about what's important to you. So, as I mentioned, you have written two books, uh, already. And the first one is called The Love. And it's very interesting. It talks a little bit about your relationship with brother, father, and the things that you have done uh, in your life. Can you tell us a little bit about why is that important um, to you, those topics that you talk about? Well, why is it important to me? I mean, it's very important for the sake of, I mean, having love and empathy for every single person in the world. And as it was mentioned in the love, quite a few times. There have been many acts of terrorism all around the world. And so I wanted to, I want to reconcile every person because there is not only Islamophobia, the West being scared of Islam, but there's also, I'm not sure how to describe it, but the Islamic people or, or Islam or extremist Islamists being scared of the West um, and trying to criminalize the West and criminalize West Western ways of life. And so, I mean, that is why we said clear relationships up. That's because we are Christian or Muslim or Orthodox or um, Catholic or Jewish or, I mean, any religion or any race or any ethnicity or any, any race, any ethnicity or any religion. No matter. That doesn't matter. We should all think of ourselves as human because we have the same heart, we have the same brain, and we are the same people. And so just because we are white, we are black, we are Hispanic, we are, I think I already said all of that stuff before, just because we are different doesn't mean we can't learn to embrace one another. We shouldn't think of differences as negative, but as positive. I thought it was interesting that, like, do you want to maybe tell us that story that you have about your mom? Uh, that was very inspiring. I, I, I thought about that even relating to our own family traditions about celebrating different holy days. So can you just have a maybe abbreviated version about that story that you had with your mom? Yeah. So basically, 
Uh, one day, it was December, and um, I was trying to buy a Christmas tree out with my dad. So we went outside in the snow, and uh, there was this guy on the street who was offering Christmas trees. He had a uh, he had a big pile of those trees. I am not sure what he was doing with them, but we decided to buy one. And then when we came back home, my mom said, "Why are you celebrating Christmas?" We are Muslims. We shouldn't be celebrating um, Christmas. Chris, Christmas is a holiday for Christians. Then I said, but mom, we shouldn't separate ourselves from others. And then my mom said, but we are Muslims. We, we aren't Hindus. We are not, not Christians. We are not Jews. We are not Buddhists. We are Muslim. And so that means that we can't celebrate Christmas. And then I said, but mom, and then my her mom put that Christmas tree away, and I almost never saw it again. And so I was so sad, and I marched out the door, and I started just walking away. And I was uh, like, How old were I, you again? Uh, how old were you, Professor, when uh, you marched out the door? Six. Six. Oh, this is when you were six years old. Okay. So, um, I, so I marched out the door and I was really sad and I was crying because I never saw that Christmas tree. And so, my, and so my mom was looking for me and she was like, Saborno, come back. I didn't mean to say that to you. And my mom was looking for me everywhere across the Bronx. She was holding up signs. And I even wrote a letter to my mom saying, Mom, I'm sorry. I know you love me and I love you too. But I think we should have empathy for all religions. My mom listened and finally I came back home. And I mean, it was such a great journey. And I think I'm grateful that I was only there for maybe one day. Hmm. Do you celebrate Christmas now? Yes. I mean, uh, I mostly celebrate Christmas for the treats, let's be real. <laughs> okay, very interesting. Now, I think you also have uh, touched upon this human crisis. How is about what that means to you? What is a human crisis? People, uh, when people are arguing over something big and it could potentially spark a conflict. I mean, that's what we've seen in the conflict described as uh, most times, right? Like, for example, the Suez crisis or very recently and very scarily the Crimean crisis. So, I mean, a crisis is really something that happens when two people disagree on a matter or when two people, um, and that can get very heated sometimes, so much that sometimes it even leads to human lives being lost. And so um, a crisis is kind of like the prelude to a conflict, and it can still be turned the other way. A crisis is basically when two people are arguing over something, and it starts to become something bigger. And sometimes a crisis is not caused by arguing, but rather it's caused by, I mean, either it's a humanitarian crisis caused by mistreatment of other humans and other people, or sometimes it's a crisis caused by external things, like um, the recent forbidden virus that got out in December of 2019. You know which one I'm talking about. And so, it's the reason that we're virtual right now. And so, um, I mean, there are sometimes crises that come from arguing, there are sometimes crises that come from mistreatment of other humans, and sometimes there are crises that come from external sources or external threats, like viruses. So, uh, what would you propose if you, if you're the leader of the world, if you are leading this world, how would you help us resolve our human crisis, the human crisis that we're actually confronting, intersecting today? Other, I want to remind every single person that others are the same as you. And that even though you should have your pride, you should not kill others or enslave others or put others down because you have that pride. Pride should, should be there, but it should not be so big that it's dangerous. 
And so, I want to remind everybody that we are all the same at heart. And even though we have, we may have our own pride, that we shouldn't let that separate us and foster animosity between us. And so, that is one of the most important things. Also, you need to reform education. Like, seriously, we not only have murderers and killers all around the world, and bad leaders as well, but we also have people who don't even bother to do anything in science. I mean, I've seen the products of the American educational system, especially in geography, and, you know, it's not good. I've seen, out of 2006 Americans, um, 12 thought that Ukraine was in their own country, so... Okay, so you're saying that there is definitely problems in our education system. Yes. Okay, well, I have to agree with you and that we all want to do something. And, and so what is your mission? You talked about, you know, change in the education system, uh, solutions for human crisis. Uh, what what do you see yourself? What is your mission? And have you developed a, a purpose for your own life? Well, I mean, education system, you know something is wrong with the education system when websites that teach, uh, that don't have any uh, websites where the are developers... The are the IQs low? Come on. Anyway, um... There are a lot of websites, I mean, you know that something is wrong with the education system if the websites uh, where the developers have absolutely no contact with the students that are learning from the website, other than maybe small chats, are teaching better than teachers who have 24-7 or almost 24-7 contact with their students. If virtual websites are teaching better than 24-7 um, real-life teachers, then that means that there's something seriously wrong. We need to introduce hands-on demonstrations to our system. And while you will have probably have seen that a million times for science or biology, you've probably never seen it once in your life. I bet you $10,000 or my entire life savings that you have never seen a single hands-on demonstration of math in a real classroom in your life. And so, that's why, I mean, we have to change our education system because so many people aren't understanding math because they aren't getting a full hands-on demonstration of what's happening around them. I mean, it's so captivating, honestly. It's kind of hard to explain why hands-on demonstrations are so good. But I mean, it's very captivating when you have to look down a microscope in science class and you can see things moving and you can see a live organisms moving around, right? So why, why don't we apply the same thing to mathematics and other things like that that don't have any hands-on demonstrations? That would make mathematics so much more interesting for so many students. And that would make so many more people captivated with math and science. That would make so many more people inspired. Have you tried to teach uh, other children mathematics using different methods? Well, yeah, there are our websites which we use to, which we use sort of like other websites to foster the virtual education. And we have also decided to teach others physically. And uh, we have also decided to teach others through videos. And so, so sometimes you may see us using um, smart boards or doing experiments on tables. Or, well, I don't know, in one case, we had this 18-year-old act, uh, we had my 18-year-old brother act like he was a six-year-old when sorting out M&Ms. And so, um, I mean, that's the thing. Um, we are trying to educate others, not only using the uh, our website method, um, berryscienceLab.tech for anybody who is wondering, uh, but we're also trying to go to, we're also trying to do like smart board demonstrations, and we're trying to teach in a way that others cannot. We're trying to teach in a way that isn't very much seen in the normal education system. So you are actually developing a website for to teach math differently, like you just described. 
Well, yeah, um, the, uh, basically, um, uh, the kind of motto, we would say, is 180 websites for 180 school days, still unofficial, and we're still building it and working on it, um, but it's good enough for now, so we're uh, building it using HTML5, and hopefully, in the future, millions of people will be learning and will be satisfied with mathematics because there are already big services like Brilliant, for example, but those services aren't big enough. They may have maybe a few million users, but there are 8 billion people in the world. And so we seek to educate every single one of those 8 billion people, or maybe 7.8, or, you know, I can't be that too precise. That's pretty ambitious, and you're saying that that's a very inclusive mission and goal that every single one will be educated. So that's education. Now, how do you see yourself moving forward 10, 20, 30 years from now? Let's see, 30, you'll be 39. Still very young to me. So uh, do you see yourself moving in uh, forward as an educator, as a scientist, maybe as a politician? Where do you, where do you see yourself moving forward? That may be an unfair question, but I want to ask you, what is your vision uh, for yourself, Professor? First, if 39 is young to you, how old are you? I won't, I won't begin to tell you. <laughs> All right. I mean, 39 seems really old to me, for one. Is that right? Okay. Everything is relative, as you know. I guess. So in 10 years, well, in two years, I believe I will be graduating from high school as I've already skipped grades once and I'm doing extremely well. And after that, I see myself doing my bachelor's degree in maybe three years and maybe my PhD will take around five. So I believe that that in 10 years, I will be done with my PhD. And maybe a few years after that, I will get professorship at Harvard. In 20 years, I plan to also be a Harvard researcher in a lab, which my brother has sadly already done before me. And, and, and um, maybe 30 years in the future, I plan not only to educate others all around the world, to inspire every single child to fall in love with math and science, and to create an organization, or, and to create a more organized form of Barry Science Lab, but I also want to run for president, and you've probably heard a million times before if you've even researched this little bit about me. Yes, I have. I just don't remember what year was it that you had planned this. What, what year was that? 2048. 2048. You were running for president of the United States. Yeah. Okay, well, I hope that you discover some new science that will keep me alive until 2028, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me finish our dialogue today and bring it home to uh, the concept of spirituality. Do you have any advice? Because I do know you, uh, that you... You, to me, that, that's part of practicing a spiritual life. You meditate, you reflect, um, you, you feed yourself with spiritual food. So that's what I know about you anyway. I don't, maybe there are things that I don't know about you. So how, how do you practice a, a spiritual life? And then what advice would you give us uh, how we could promote you know, Mark and I want to promote more love-based compassion and love in the world. That is tuning into the spiritual side of ourselves. Give us some advice from your perspective. I mean, I see ourselves as all the same at heart. And maybe we all have the same spirit or maybe all the same soul. Who knows? And we should all unite together. We should all think of ourselves as one. And I believe that this dialogue, because it has people old and young from different cultures and ethnicities all around the world. In fact, we even have a translator over here that's translating this into Chinese for a Chinese or a Taiwanese audience. So, um, I mean, I'm very proud of not only that skill. Thank you. 
but I think that also it is very important to unite ourselves, think of ourselves as well one race instead of like a billion different races based on where we come from or our, where our ethnicity is. Now, we should all think of ourselves as one and the same. We should all think of ourselves, as I've said earlier, as not, as not black, not Muslim, not Hindu. Okay, I've already said that. But we should think of ourselves as human. We should think of ourselves as just human and nothing else other than that. And so that is why I think that it is important to think of our spirit maybe as maybe hmm, we are all the same at home and we are all the same at spirit and we have all the same mind. And so, even though we may have different talents, or different, um, we have may have different talents, um, or different um, ideologies, or different race, or different culture, or different anything, we are still one in the same. We are still human, and we shouldn't let any other barriers separate us even more and foster animosity between our race. So. Mm, I, be, I don't really have anything to say about spirit. As I've said before, I'm not too sure about spiritual belief because I haven't really learned anything about psychology yet, and I'm not even sure the top psychologists have learned anything about consciousness yet. But, I mean, I am looking out, and if I find anything about consciousness, if, I, or if we get a deeper understanding of consciousness, maybe I will start to think of um, the possibility of a spirit or a soul or something in that kind. Okay, so there's hope for us human beings on this planet. Um, do you have confidence that we could conquer problems such as climate change? problems such as wars and conflict do you have that confidence that we shall overcome i think that we can together through cooperation overcome challenges such as climate change or the covid19 uh, or the covid19 uh, pandemic or the crisis that is uh, the crisis other crises that are happening all around the world however i am not so sure about getting over war i mean war is basically I mean, something that has been overturned, uh, has been happening for centuries and millennia. And I want to stop war. I want to stop um, the tensions and conflicts between others. And I think that through cooperation with each other and a realization that even though we, we may be of different races and different kinds and we may have differences from one another, we are still the same people at heart. I think that will make sure that there was less conflict. That philosophy is one of the most important things to realize that we are all the same. And I see so many different kinds of people uh, from all over the world. As you mentioned yourself, we have people from all over the world. And we have people of different ages, from 5 to 98. So, I mean, we are all the same people. And it's never too old or too young to start learning mathematics or physics or any subjects like that. And war and conflict, we can stop it together through co cooperation. We can stop it together through realizing that we are all one and the same. And after that, there may still be uh, there may still be conflicts, but those are either out of selfishness for, uh, for wanting to keep hold of maybe colonial territory or something like that. Or uh, because of greed, you want to get more resources from others because they have more resources than you. So I think that it is very important to lessen corruption between ourselves and realize that we are also one and the same human beings. That goes back to the point that you made about education, infusing the curriculum of empathy in the curriculum and uh, helping people to have imaginations to create new solutions for the human being. That's why I, I love that talk that you gave. So I am going to stop here because I'm hogging all the time for people. And I know there are others who have their own curiosities. So let's um, 
open it up to see what questions that we may have from people. Okay, I have a hand up from uh, Mr. Chowdhury. If you want to unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Thank you, sir, for giving me an opportunity to question. And I want to question, sir, I'm very interested to in physics. And would you please tell me, is it really possible to establish civilization in Moon or Mars? And is it really possible to invent time machines? Well, I'm pretty sure that we at least will be able to establish some sort of small civilization on the moon. Even because even though the moon has uninha uninhabitable conditions as of now, there are definitely ways which will, in which we can innovate to make sure that the moon becomes habitable once again. Um, looks like something's wrong with your camera. However, I'm not very sure about the time machine thing. Time machines have already opened many paradoxes that cannot be solved. So I don't think that we can travel into the past, although special relativity has already proved, special and general relativity has already proved that we can travel into the future somewhat. We cannot travel into the past. The past is history. And sir, what is your future plan to give anything to the world? I want to, I want to, well, change the education system. And I want to make sure that every single child has their genius unfold. And whether their talent is in mathematics or in physics or in art or in uh, psychology or something else in that matter. And Mr. Joshi has his pen up. And do you please tell me, do you read any other books such as novels or stories? And whose po poet do you prefer? Which writer do you prefer? Well, I don't really prefer any one writer. However, there are a few poets that I'm reading. Uh, one of them is Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and I also am currently reading a novel I am also currently reading about the, a novel, which I can't exactly remember the author's name. But it, I read many novels and I read many books, and it is uh, and literature is also of a lot of importance to me as well. And do you please translate your books, your written books, that book you have written? Yeah, we are translating them currently. Hey, great. Oh, what, are the title, what are the titles to those books? Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the love. You're translating the, the love to different languages? Yeah, we've already Manage. translated the love to Bengali. And we're doing the same with uh, our second book, Manis. Manis is uh, being translated as well. Okay, yeah. those two books are actually available right now on Amazon. I, I have bought them in the Kindle form. So anyway, let's go move on to the next. Sorry, actually, sir, I have come from yeah, Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I'm a student of class nine. Thank, thank you, you for your questions. Uh, Dr. Kari. And thanks all of you for giving me an opportunity to question. No problem. Thank you. All right, let's see, Mr. Joshi. Thank you so kindly. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. We are lucky to have you in humanity in the 9th, 22nd century. You know, we are really have, we have all the problems that you are right now on the, on the face. Why we are military and all that, but we are very lucky to have people like you. I hope there are more of you. My question is: It has been known for quite a while that some kids seem to remember their past life, even this. Uh, professor in, in West Virginia, he had done research for the past 30 years. They remember where, where they were born, what they did, and where they lived. Are you, do you remember anything if you were, uh, you had a past life? Well, um, yeah. Oh, past, go ahead. Um, past lives are uh, kind of a pretty weird subject, but 
uh, I have not really um, thought about any sort of past life, and even though, um, and even though uh, a, a few people have said that I might be the reincarnation of Newton or Einstein, I personally don't remember of any past mean? life or anything in that respect. What do you mean reincarnation? Um, okay. I think I'll give uh, time for the others. So. Let, let, let us one question at a time. All right, thank you so much. And we have Tanner. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was just, I have a couple questions actually, if you don't mind. Um, I was just wondering if there was a defining moment you realized you were different from other children, or if you just thought everyone was that gifted at mathematics at that age. Well, I feel that everybody is gifted in a certain subject, and I'm, I'm not very sure it's mathematics. And, uh, there are uh, definitely some kids who don't want to learn mathematics because they don't see it as fun, and maybe they just don't have that passion. There are people who have different passions, but I'm sure that there are also a lot of people like me. And at first, it was kind of the opposite. I thought I thought that I was pretty. Uh, I thought that I was pretty unique. That I was like one of the only who had that talent. But I now realize that there are probably millions of other children who have that talent. And as I said before, they are probably being ridiculed because they're doing something different. That they have different communities, and uh, so those communities are always nurturing them or their talent. And so I. Uh, at first thought of myself as unique, but now I realize that there are other people with that same talent who just aren't being nurtured. Mm. And you're just saying that there are many hidden jewels like you, and just that we don't know how to mine those jewels, right? To, to let them, their brilliance come out like you have. Kind of, I say. Very like good. I'm glad you said that. That's wonderful. That, that's a very fruitful thought for those of us who are in education, those of us who have children and grandchildren, about the hidden jewels that each person has. Thank you. And we have uh, Natalie. Uh. Natalie, you have a question. Yeah. yeah, I do. I wanted to know what is your social like like in your community, uh, you know, because on a regular basis, you're interacting with many adults. But what about children your own age? Do you have the opportunity to have a social life? Because that's important for growth also. Um, well, I think that it's very important to have a social life, especially with other kids of your age. And yes, I have talked with others, and uh, some of them have, uh, some of them have know that um think that I'm a genius, but kind of like ignore it or something, and talk to me as if I'm a regular nine year old. And others have just recently found out. Um, the <coughs> rumor has it that there's this genius kid standing in the. Uh, in the fourth grade class that's um uh, that's uh, really good at math and is destroying everybody and so um i mean the uh, sometimes people just uh, sometimes people just ignore that fact and uh, talk to me as if i'm a regular nine-year-old which i see is okay and sometimes people are like oh my god look at this kid so what do you do for fun things is basically the question you know well, what do you do for enjoyment? A lot of times for enjoyment, sometimes I do math and physics, or sometimes I play with my brother. I play games like chess, or maybe um, chess or uh, Scrabble. And sometimes, re and very rarely, recently, that um, one game that's been blowing over the internet, Wordle, and some of things like that. I try to have fun with my brother or my father or my parents as much as I can. Thank you. No problem. All right. Thank you. And Mr. Chen? Hi. It's great to meet you. Uh, my question is very simple. One day you will get married and have your own nine-year-old son or boy or girl, what will be the most important subject 
area of knowledge you want to teach your child? Well, I'm not sure yet. I think that it's best for them to learn their own passion and then nurture them in that field, even if I'm not very sure about that field, like maybe art or something of that respect. I mean, it's kind of a coincidence that my passion was mathematics and that my father just happened to be a mathematics student. And if I think that it depends on what my child's passion is. If I'm going, if, um, I'm going to teach that child mathematics or something else thank you learn the child's passion wonderful I'm going to jump in here for just a second and ask the professor if your parents were not mathematicians do you think you would be this well and doing this well in math today uh, well, first of all, my mother isn't really um, my mother isn't really a mathematician. She's actually an accountant and a teacher, but um, she still supports me emotionally. Um, I'm not very sure if I was I would be able to nurture my passion or nurture my talent if my parents weren't mathematicians, as we weren't living in exactly the best of conditions in 2012. But things have improved since then and now we have our own studio we have our own everything and so uh, my parents have nurtured me through it all the way and I believe that in the right conditions even if my parents weren't mathematicians um, I would still be good at mathematics but maybe that wouldn't have happened in an alternate 2012 and when uh, if my, when my father was not a mathematician we were still living in the same sort of like uh, bad conditions so it is possible to nurture that uh, talent and the passion, whatever the child's passion is. Great. By Mr. Gassini. Mr. Gassini. Yes. Hi, Mr. Tomorrow. Very nice to meet you. Uh, it seems like you have already mentioned that you believe in uh, equality of, and oneness of mankind and you believe in oneness of all religions. If you become the president, would you be actually believing or practicing equality of man and woman, elimination of prejudice, uh, and independent investigation of through those are type of things that are not practiced? Would you be interested in uh, disarmament of the um, world of all these uh, machine guns and uh, and bombs. Well, a lot of times weapons are kept to secure um, a country or secure the safety of a nation. But sometimes those weapons go out of hand and they're just used to randomly kill or torture or um, injure others. Who and so I mean, and I think that. I mean, we have already sort of gone that way with chemical weapons. I mean, we've already fully banned chemical weapons by the Geneva Convention. And so, I mean, if that goes that way for all weapons, I mean, I'm kind of ready for it. And so, I mean, a lot of weapons are invented by science. And science is both a blessing and a curse. Those weapons, can, uh, kind of like dynamite, for example, can help uh, can help lots of people. For example, it was invented by Alfred Nobel to um, help with uh, um, digging tunnels, I believe. But then he was disgusted at seeing it being used in, a million, in warfare and leading to the death of uh, millions of lives. And, and fun fact, that was the reason he created the Nobel Prize, to try and redeem himself. And so... Um, I mean, science can be both a blessing and a curse, as it can invent things that are both good and bad for humanity. And so, weapons are <clears throat> weapons sometimes serve just as we uh, weapons just serve as tools to hurt people sometimes. And so, if they're not for safety or self-defense, 
if they're for warfare or for ke uh, killing others um, unlawfully uh, based on prejudice or religion or uh, something like that, then I believe they should, uh, shouldn't be allowed. Um, however, I think we we're a long way from banning all weapons, as there were still many people who see warfare and, mil uh, and um, war as an inevitable thing. Great, thank you. And also, do you believe in a, a true United Nations tribunal where there is no few, four or five veto rights to control the whole world? Well, I mean, the, the Council of the United Nations, consisting of only five powers, I mean, I'm not very sure about that. But I think, uh, but I think that even if uh, one vetoes and the other four agrees, uh, that's still one huge part. Of what? The, what? Uh, who? Who's the smartest scientist uh, to you that you think ever? Yeah, the century. Uh, sorry, I was responding to uh, Mr. Gassini. Um, but well, he's asking you uh, about. Please wait, please, sir. Please wait. Let him finish, please. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, if you have yeah, a question, you can address yeah. those questions at me. You understand? I'll answer uh, you. Both. I will. I will call. I'll call on you next. As far as Saborno, as far as Saborno, what I want to know is. Hold on. Wait till your turn, and I'll. Uh, he is responding to Mr. Gassimi's question. Go ahead, Professor. I mean, even. If that veto power for for one out of five didn't work, um, then there would still be a huge portion of the world left unrepresented. I can't uh, uh, say something for sure about well the United Nations Council of Security. I believe that's some of what it's called. But maybe those five superpowers, um, well, those five superpowers are really the major powers of the world: the UK, France, the USA, China, and I believe. Russia, which was formerly the USSR, I mean, those five powers, which make up a good percentage of the world's population, I mean, if they dictate every single thing that happens, that wouldn't be the best of ideas. But if they can cooperate with all of the smaller nations and all of the minor powers or all of the secondary powers, I think that um, the UN Council of Security um, might work, but um, for I just can't say too much about the veto power. Thank you so much. It's an honor to meet you today. Thank no. you. No, it's fine. Okay, Mr. Thor Mr. Thor I have a question. I have another question. Let's let talk my question. How can I improve my knowledge, basic knowledge in physics? Um, is, could you please tell me? I guess I can say, uh, be passionate, work hard, um, never give up, because um, learning about physics is one of the most important things. Realize that learning about physics is essential, and that, um, and you should be passionate about it. You should not give up, and you should persevere through the hardest of times. Hey, you um, said you have a website, uh, Professor? I guess. You have a website with with live demonstrations, maybe you can share that website uh, um, with everybody. Uh, people like Mr. Chowdhury might go to the website and learn math and physics. Um, how about Mr. Thorkison? Um, I have a simple question. First, you, you blow my mind and I love you. <laughs> now my question. Will there ever be time travel? Well, I mean, I think uh, Mr. Chowdhury asked this before, but I'm not very sure about um, time travel because it has already opened so many paradoxes and special rel and general relativity has proved that um, even though we can travel to, into the future, and there was absolutely no way to travel into the past. So, um, sadly, I can't change um, that undelicious lunch I had five days ago. <laughs> okay. Now, I see a hand up, but I don't have a name. 714-742-8899. Uh, Do you have a question? No, that's Tom. That's Tom. Oh, that is Tom. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to circle back to uh, Mr. Ahmed. 
You yeah. have wanted to ask a question. This is your opportunity to ask a question. Uh, Mr. Bono, uh, much of, uh, I don't know if you've gone mainstream yet, but much of what I see, yeah, yeah you were interested in field equations. Uh, you're brilliant. So. Truly, truly, there is no Einstein necessarily. You understand that, or anyone. But what I wanted to know is, who do you think was smart as far as, yeah, as far as, as far as, don't worry about Laplace. And so, uh, Einstein would be uh, recent to you. You understand? Uh, do you think Einstein was smart, essentially? I mean, Einstein was one of the figures who completely changed physics. So, saying that what, uh, he wasn't smart would be a complete injustice to the entire realm of physics. I mean... Uh, regarding I'm, mathematics, regarding mathematics, Suborno, uh, we're math talking about... In but yeah, TV relativity, yeah, but yeah, but not general relativity, but yeah, I'm well aware of Suborno, obviously. What about pi, essentially? Essentially, you have a video about Rainbow also. Rajamand and a lot of things, obviously. So basically, and uh, much of much of knowledge is coherent. Uh, whether whether you like people is not what people want to know here, basically. And uh, so I asked you about reincarnation. This is basically conceptual dynamics here, basically. So basically, what I'm asking about it is: Have you read the Nobel book, essentially, of Einstein? Essentially? Have you read it? What? You've read relativity, essentially. You've read relativity, haven't you? Yes, I know. I know, <laughs> I know okay, about the general well, theory for but, but, but yes, what is the point of going to school then that you're saying about you, you're you going to high school and basically what, what Harvard exists? Uh, so parallel continuity and pi, obviously, and the, the difficulty here, pi essentially and exists too much of, much, much of math. You understand that? So, a hypotenuse of a right triangle uh, was the difficulty with the past that doesn't exist. Uh, whether Jesus Christ exists or the Prophet Muhammad or God, nobody asks you about. But what most people want to know is, is the Nobel, the Nobel Book of Einstein, you understand that? Is the brilliance that you have over yesterday, yes. You understand that? Nobody asks you about anything about religion. Einstein will suffice. Do you want the Nobel in the future before being a president or anything? Yes, of course what, I want the Nobel Prize. I've uh, mentioned what, that earlier. What, what if the, well, there's no finding necessarily here also to research also with Einstein. That is the Nobel. It suffices as a book. Now, linguistics, the field of linguistics exists. You know, uh, much of science is advanced in the United States, and uh, you know, the process is not continuity here. So the question is, why do you want to go to? Why do you want? What school do you like? What school do you want to go to? This is America. What school do you want to go to? Well, MIT doesn't exist. Harvard doesn't exist. I went to Emory University. Do you want to go to Emory University? That, that is that is that is a, that is the America that exists. You understand that? Okay, you want you wanna, let's let's ask the professor to respond to your question. Well, uh, yes, okay. that is America, Sabon. Okay. Um, I think if Harvard and MIT wouldn't exist, I would say the third best option is either Columbia or Princeton because both of those are extremely prestigious universities that have accomplished so many things and so many research goals. And so if Harvard or MIT didn't exist, uh, and they do, and they have won the majority of Nobel Prizes, um, then, I mean, I would go to either Columbia University or Princeton University because both of those were extremely prestigious. And for a few months in 2020, Princeton actually surpassed Harvard for a little bit. I'm glad you're paying attention. Uh, I see Tanner, did you have another question? Yeah, just one more question, kind of a more general, general question just about him. Um, Actually, it's like a two-parter. What is your uh, what is your day-to-day -day routine consist of? And this is kind of more just to to uh, what's what's your favorite movie? And I want to see how it compares to every other nine-year-old. Well, 
Um, my day routine goes somewhat like um, I wake up at somewhere around 5 a.m., then I read five holy books, then I have to get ready for school at 6.30. I depart for school and I come back at 3 o'clock. And after that, I bike for 30 minutes. If my brother is home, I will uh, try and talk with him for a few more minutes. And then after that, I take a nap. And when I wake up, I start doing uh, I start doing things like preparing for videos. I start doing things like studying. And um, when I'm doing, if I don't have anything to do, if I have free time, then I'm just going to solve mathematics problems, or I can talk with my brother, or I can play with my brother. And after that, I try and get knowledge on the theory of everything. And finally. Um, about the movie thing you asked me, um, I watched yes, qu quite a few movies. I, I guess I could say that the best movie I've watched or the <clears throat> best movie I've watched was Spider-Man No Way Home. Maybe that's just because I have a trend of liking recent things. Even everybody in my family had noticed that by now. You get up at 5 a.m. and you read five holy books, did you say? Mm-hmm. What, what holy books do you read at 5 a.m. every day? Um, the Quran, of course. Um, then we have the Bible. I also read okay. the Torah. I read the Bhagavad Gita. And finally, I read the Tripitaka. Oh, that's on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. At 5 a.m. Okay. I need to wake up earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everybody could well, really wake up earlier. Putting us to shame. <laughs> All right, I could add a few more books for you. Trust me. Okay, I'll send them to you. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> uh, I was wondering uh, if you have read any of the uh, Baha'i uh, books or uh, Bay books or Baha'i materials at all. I mean, you can buy them on either Amazon or Barnes & Noble, so... <laughs> Okay, any other uh, questions? We are formally closing our spiritual dialogues now. And so that those of you who need to leave can. And if you want to stay after, we always open the room for further dialogue a little bit more. Uh, Professor, can you stay on a little bit more if some want to stay and chat? Uh, sure. Hey, may I ask a question? Yeah, Okay. Good. Professor, so what, what is your view of how we are likely to end up with all the chaos which is happening? Or will there be more people like you and others who will need to seek peace and help us out? Well, the amount of chaos that is happening is uh, very remarkable. There were crises all around the world happening. There are people who are fighting over small slivers of territory that they have historically claimed, like, I don't know, 500 years ago. And there were people uh, feuding over the smallest of things, usually because of uh, racism or because it's strategic or because, they're, uh, uh, or because they want greed or, <clears throat> or they want greed or resources or something of that matter. So we need to not only solve the problems of racism and quarreling, but also of like corruption and greed. So I mean, that I think is the way we can stop chaos and war from happening. Hey, that's the- I see uh, Douglas and Bahare Smith. Yes, thank you so much, Professor, for this wonderful um, presentation. Very uplifting. Um, my question, I'm, I'm an educator and a teacher educator. My question and also reflection is that many times you mentioned you have no um, evidence or understanding about the soul or a spirituality. And yet, all your thoughts and all your solutions, to my understanding, were spiritually based. And the fact that you also have become such an enlightened person spiritually, I cannot help it, but also uh, think 
uh, or believe that not only your parents as mathematicians motivated you to love math and discovering sciences and physics in particular, but they also responded to your spiritual aspiration. So would you say that the existence of this spiritual aspiration at such a young age is not only an evidence of soul and a spirit, is also such an important part of education, as you mentioned. I'm also like you thinking that um, we need to, to change our approach to education. So um, your thoughts on best way to respond to this innate aspiration in children. Um, I would be very happy to hear your response. Thank you so much again. No problem. Now, um, I mean, spiritual aspirations are not something I really think of from day to day. And as I said, I mean, we know that consciousness is something, and maybe consciousness could be another word for maybe uh, the spirit. And, but, uh, however, we don't really know too much about consciousness. And so that's why I'm kind of taking a careful approach to um, the spirit or the soul or anything of that kind. Very good. Thank you so much. That is very true that the nature of soul is beyond our comprehension as human beings, but the existence of a spiritual power, a spiritual part of us is definitely... Uh, you have angels, Sabrina. You have angels. Yes. And, and I, I'm going to interject and ask you about, uh, related to uh, Bahá'í's question, why do you read uh, the five holy books in the morning? Is there a particular reason for you? What does that do for you? Well, it's really uh, the subject of empathy. Um, I mean, we have to have empathy for one another. We have to think of each other as well, all the same. We have to think of each other as all the same. And by doing that, I'm showing, I'm showing my respect to all other religions. I'm trying to show respect and empathy for every single person who believes in other religions or other faiths or something in that kind. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, uh, Mr. Zhang, Jeff. Uh, hello, Sir Bono, and I'm very happy to ask you a question. And yeah, from your speaking, uh, I think most of us like us really can feel very surprised your very mature understanding your your conversation uh, as the nine year old uh, children because I remember I grew up, I once grew up in an environment uh, I, as I saw uh, many uh, I saw many kids getting bullied and get got many trauma and also under much pressure. Uh, I think even nowadays, uh, because I live in China, so I, I also was uh, an English teacher. So I see that many students, even when they were very young, they really under such great pressure. Uh, they, they, they study, they learn, um, really not for the pressure, but most of the time uh, for the for getting high grades, high marks, and also many trauma, many emotional up and downs. They do not have the feel that do not have very healthy mental state. So uh, do you have some any advice to the children, to the students, as well as the educator, parent, adults? Thank you. Well, my advice to all students and par uh, parents is for students, we uh, you should persevere. You should always work hard and you should try and um, persevere. You should try and do something nobody has ever done. And I mean, we already discussed that at the beginning of the conversation uh, during that song you played. I still can't remember the name. Um, so... Mm. I mean, for and for parents, I think that the best thing to do is to see your child's passion. Look for your child's passion. When you find it, you should nurture it as much as you can. You should try and make sure. Thank you.
All right, and we have uh, Navid Amina, Aminia. Yes, um, <clears throat> Professor Bari, uh, you have been most impressive. I truly thank you for all that you have shared. Sometimes I feel it isn't fair for us to ask you so many questions on so many different topics. Uh, I myself, I'm a math teacher. And can you give us one example as to how we can demonstrate a math problem? Because previously you mentioned that uh, most teachers lack this. They do not demonstrate a math concept. Is it possible to give us an example? Well, quite a few teachers don't demonstrate math problems because, I mean, a lot of times you can use websites to um, demonstrate hands-on, but other times you can use structures, like, for example, paper. And I've seen um, paper or uh, experiments used in science class, so why can't we do them in math class? Why can't we use, uh, use paper to express the, um, geometry? Why can't we think of why can't we think of innovative ways to um, make students more interested in algebra? Like for example, I kind of think of algebra as a sort of battlefield between the positive and the negative numbers. I mean, maybe I'm kind of weird for thinking of that, but it's kind of a way to encourage uh, to make students more interested in mathematics or algebra or something of that kind. And so that is, I find that extremely important. So I think that we should be using that kind of hands-on, uh, those kind of hands-on tools. So those are just uh, two things that I can name, but. Thank you. And so Professor Bari, when you are in class, you said you're in grade four and your math teacher is teaching you. Do you ever say things to your math teacher as to how something should be taught or you just go with the flow? I mean, uh, most of the time I just go with the flow because I'm not really one for fourth grade education. I haven't really experienced what it's, be, uh, what it's like to be in like um, the shoes of a regular fourth grader who doesn't really know anything about mathematics. But I think that uh, for one, it's very fun for them to learn mathematics using the activities they do already or uh, something like that. And so I think that um, I don't really have any advice for the fourth grade math teachers. Maybe that's just because I'm not one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall, I see? shall I see? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, sharing yourself with us. It's been wonderful to listen to you. I'm wondering why you chose five holy books and you have not chosen maybe Zoroastrian's book or Baha'u'llah's book. Well, I've decided to do that because they're the five major religions. And I mean, if I read the holy books of every single religion in the world, I would probably die before I read all of them once, so. My other question is that I believe deeply that inequality between men and women and lack of education to women is contributed to war. I deeply believe that when women have the rightful place in the, in the world, we will not have war, we will have peace. Because I deeply believe that women uh, tend to not want to have war as uh, uh, and of course as a mother I would never want to send my child to war so I would be uh, more inclined not to eliminate war what uh, do you consider an inequality of men and women as an issue well inequality of men and women it's definitely an issue um, maybe one that doesn't cause war nowadays, but it's still causing inequality within millions of people and it's causing hun hundreds of thousands or, or even billions to be mistreated horribly. And so it was a huge problem. It's, uh, it was a huge problem in the U.S. in the, uh, the late 1800s or the, all of the 1800s in the early 1900s. And it is still definitely a problem in many uh, countries that for 
or regions that follow Sharia law. Um, so a lot of places, in a lot of places, women are being mistreated. And so that's why I think it is important to foster equality between both men and women. Because women are the same as men. We shouldn't let gender be separating us. Forget all of the things we already have separating us. Thank you very much. Appreciate your answers. Thank you. And uh, I'm looking. Uh, are, do you have another question, uh, Mr. Arminian? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Professor Bari, uh, that's fantastic that you show in a practical manner that you don't have any religious prejudice. And I encourage you to go ahead in this field, what you're doing. This is really, really good especially by trying to compare and seeing the, the, the sameness in religions rather than the differences. Okay, that will be of great help. And it really doesn't matter uh, which religious book you're looking at. In due course of time, you'll be looking at more and more other religions. So I fully encourage you to do what you're doing. Well done. Thank you. All right, and Jane. Hello. Hi. Dr. Barry, thank you very much. It's very touching presentation. And uh, there's a lot for us to digest. Uh, you are very inspiring. And uh, my question I want to ask is that you selected this uh, five holy books to write, to read. And on daily basis, it's very touching at this age. And I see the great hope for the future, yeah? So uh, especially you are already taking the leadership to spread the empathy and the love and uh, non-religious. So it's very, very, for me, it's a kind of a, uh, God's greatest work. So what I want to ask is, so far as now you have read these are holy books. What are the common essence you have found? And I like that concept that you say, you want to respect all the people, so therefore you have realized these books of the holy writings people believe in history affected their life. So you want to read them and to find what the common says, how to unite the people as one human race. Would you like to share some points? You have read these five books and then what are the uh, common essence and what is the reason people are fighting? How do we bring the peace? Thank you. Well, first, I've uh, read quite a bit of the Quran and it encourages a lot of times peace. And, and it encourages um, and it encourages, well, no war. It encourages peace between all religions and respect of all religions. And in Buddhism, um, I have read the Tripitaka a little bit. And um, it says that if you do something bad, like for robbery or greed, then later you will become a ghost who does some very ugly things. So, I mean, they all encourage peace and to do well and to do good in the world. And, how, uh, and that that will balance um, the fight between good and evil. And the second thing I wanted to say is um, how can we stop fighting? Well, we have to realize that first of all, we have to eliminate all of the racial barriers, all of the ideological barriers, all of the religious barriers that we have right now. And so that um, all of those things are well, blocking us from realizing that we're all human at heart and that we are all the same people. And second, we have to eliminate greed and corruption because for a, a lot of times that's what ca causes resource wars. And um, th that's going to be a thing that's unaffected by um, uniting as one. It's wonderful, greed and corruption. Um, I, I'm going to ask the question that it's in the chat. It's, my seven-year-old daughter is watching. What advice would you give her? 
Well, um, the advice that I would give to her is, um, your seven-year-old girl, <coughs> you said keep strong. You said always do what you want, and you said find your passion. You shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't be influenced by those around you, and you shouldn't be forced by those around you to do what they want. You should be your own determined owner. And to the parent of um, that seven-year-old, uh, to the parent of that seven-year-old girl, um, Tan, I believe, um, I would like to say you should let your child follow their own path. You should let your child um, go do what they want in life. And so I think that's one of the most important things. And um, that's my advice to her and her um, um, parent. What happens if you are a child that your parents are forcing you and say, I'm interested in music or oh, music. Don't, don't worry about music. It's not going to make you any money. Do something else. Uh, what do you say to that child whose parents is forcing their own interest on them? Well, what should that child do? Try to, Try to make your passion succeed even in secret um, and try to show uh, your parents that uh, what you're doing, it can succeed and uh, what you're doing can actually work. And so then they may be convinced. And also music definitely makes a lot of money. Just look at the big music companies and all of the big singers. By the way, I still can't remember the name of that song you uh, um, put up at the beginning. Maybe that's because it's been two hours. <laughs> Mark, you have to share that name of the song that you played at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Well, goodness. I don't, if there is no other questions, I'm going to uh, let you go, yeah, yeah, sir, because uh, it's been two, almost two hours that you have been <laughs> quizzed mm -hmm. with questions peppering at you. So, you have done wonderfully, and I have learned a lot. I'm sure those who have joined have us will feel the same. Yes, Mr. Ackerman, you have your last question. What's the bono? Uh, Archimedes was smart. Well, we found out that Plutarch, Plutarch was smarter than him, obviously, but basically. Plutarch is the priest of Apollo, though. You understand? Apollo, the, uh, you know, Apollo, the medicine symbol, the god of earth, so and so. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's a porno. Archimedes was, yeah, but basically, but Plutarch is is uh, pie as far as pie, yeah, as far as pie. Um, but do yeah, you, do you mean Plato? No, Plut nah, Plato, Plato, no, Plato, Hemlock, no, Plato, Hemlock was to him, obviously. The Aristotle, as far as the United States, is the one. Why is a porno? Because he pointed that way. And the Plato was pointing the other way. You understand? You, you do know that. Right? I, I'm not hey, very. Now we do. Aristotle, why did Aristotle point that way? Essentially. All yeah, right. That's that's that's. that's, that's the bonus. Thank you for that insight. That, that's not bullshit. Is each other, obviously. But basically, what? I'm... Okay. Uh, let's see, Mr. Bethel. You are muted no, no, if you no, have a you. question. I have a, uh, it's, it's sort of a question and sort of a consideration. Uh, Dr. Buddy, in your study of the five books of uh, religion, uh, have you thought of the concept or the idea that the source for all of those books is the same? in that when they speak of God, Allah, Christ, so forth, they're talking about the same creative force that inspires and gives the uh, human uh, creation its ability to uh, understand, to learn, and to advance in life. The basic question is considering it the same source. Hmm. Well, I could see 
um, the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic books coming from the same source. They're all um, Abrahamic religions, which um, most of the time tell the same historic events and have basically the same gods. However, um, I cannot see the same uh, say the same thing for Buddhism or Hinduism. Hinduism has a bunch of gods, while Buddhism doesn't seem to have any. It's kind of just like a philosophy. So I don't see all of them coming from the same source, but possibly some of them have. And and some of those gods may have been created by the believers themselves. Um, just an idea. In other, in other words, and then they given names for different, um, perf- uh, let's say, attributes of God, honesty, kindness, mercifulness, and so forth, so that uh, they sort of uh, felt like uh, personifying and uh, raising up each of those attributes as uh, a means to achieving them. So thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Maybe that's one that you'll further investigate. Yes, Professor? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any final words before we part for today? Um, Yeah, I would say um, I want to inspire every single child and every single person to fall in love with math and science. Yeah, it's never too young and never too old to learn math and science. And I and to that 98 year old who was watching one of these spiritual dialogues, I believe that you can be learning math right now. To that five year old that watched one of your dialogues, you're likely already learning math. Mathematics is everywhere around you, and it's one of the most important things. Thank you very much. And uh, we is there a way that we can contact you further, Professor Barry? Um, is there an email address that we can contact you, sir. or you you prefer not to? Um, yeah, I guess we yeah, can send you some question. contact details. Um, RB thirty four o eight. I I'll just put it in the chat. I don't think yeah, I can send it. Yeah, if you do it, yeah, and the chat will be good. Thank you. So I have another question. Maybe it's my last question. And yes. it's to you. All general child of nine years old wants to play instead of study. And do you want to play with any other child or you want to study always? What? Are you talking about the nine year old usually likes to play? And does he want to play sometimes? Yes. Oh. I want to tell this. Um, well, sometimes I um, play board games or physical games with my brother. So sometimes I do play sometimes, I guess. So you do have that desire to have fun, right? Yes. I think everybody should have that. Thank you. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. His son is also doing mathematical problems. Yes. Uh, and I think he likes uh, games which challenge his power of thought. In other words, reasoning and figuring things out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very so, good. So, Barry, would you be writing your email address for us in the chat? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, just give me a sec. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I hope that you have been inspired 